start by saying uh, welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for showing up. Um, and it's a pleasure to see everybody. First time we've had somebody online talking about teaching um, and avoiding fear. Although I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday, Tristram, where we agreed that it was quite right to have a bit of fear about climate because <laughs> otherwise we wouldn't take the necessary steps. But anyway, um, rather than my uh, spend a long-winded time introducing Maddie, whom I've not met before, let me ask you, Maddie, if you'd like to take over and introduce yourself, please. Yes. Yeah, so um, I'm Maddie McGregor. I'm an environmental science graduate um, that's proudly representing Community Climate Action today. Uh, I also have a face painting business. So if anyone needs face paint in your local area, I'm your woman for that. You can uh, pop me an email. Um so Community Climate Action is essentially an organisation that um, creates uh, participatory workshops in the community for them to create action plans to get to net zero by 2030. Uh, so we look at the current uh, greenhouse gas emissions of a parish or a town and the biodiversity levels, and then we create the action plans based off of that. Uh, it's so important that the community create the action plans because then it creates a sense of ownership over it. Um, and it has proven quite successful in Suffolk, where I'm based. If there's any questions on community climate action, I'll save those for the end because we're focusing today on the education side of it. But I'm pretty sure Jules has probably been on a call talking about community climate action before. So, um, Today, we're looking at the importance of teaching action and not just fear with climate science and how this can be used to engage our community um, with community climate action and trying to get them on board. So essentially, um, it is really, really important, and I'm an absolute sucker for climate change science, that we teach people about climate change science so that they understand the reality of the situation in order to create um, a want and emphasis on the urgency to create um, adaptations and mitigation strategies against climate change. Um, also, though, it is really, really important that, especially with young children, we do this without creating a sense of eco-anxiety against the problem. So, uh, for example, when I was really, really young, um, I went to an evening at the local fire station and it was all about um, fire safety and although it was a really really fun evening and afternoon I came away from it absolutely so scared that the house was going to go on fire at any point and I was getting my mum to check the uh, fire alarms constantly and it was just a real fear that was instilled within me so it is a good example of how children can sort of take one tiny thing and uh, blow it up in their minds so um Within Community Climate Action, some things that they have done in the past is they've taken, uh, focused on the action points and the solutions and adaptations, and they've taken uh, like houses, like fake houses, fake streets, and we can show the children like where the installation goes on a home, for example. But I am obviously so passionate about climate change science. So um, I've actually incorporated the two together um, successfully and I will touch on how I did this uh, later on um, so um, in the guide meetings and I'll show you about that a little bit later so firstly um, I just want to talk about the importance of teaching action to adults so it's really important to educate the communities on the science of climate change so they have the urgency to adapt and mitigate as we've spoken on also, I'm a very, very young person and I cannot speak for absolutely everyone in the older generation, but a lot of the time I've come across uh, people that are very comfortable with uh, relying and waiting on the government to solve the problem and make the change. So it's also really important that we teach people that they do have the permission to act and make these changes and not wait for uh, governments to change laws or councils to get the funding to enable their action plans. Um, also, it's within adults, it's really, really fun to eliminate the misconceptions with climate change. So uh, a good example that I always, always, always come across is electric cars. 
So many, many people will say, oh, you know, electric cars are bad because uh, the batteries that they use are mined from the ground. Um, and then this is bad for the environment and we shouldn't use them. When in actual fact, uh, it's quite common knowledge within the environment that everything we do has an environmental impact, but it's just about finding the thing that has the least environmental impact within that. So for example, with an electric car, yes, it has a bad impact when the battery is taken out of the ground, but at point of use and continued use, it has a lesser effect on climate change than a petrol or a diesel car. Obviously, that depends if the government have renewables high in their energy mix, but that is another conversation for another time. <laughs> but it's just a good example. So then uh, with the youth, the importance of teaching youth action is um, school curriculums do include environmental science and forest schools, but they are non-compulsory and many schools lack the funding or they lack the time or space to include such activities. This is particularly, I should imagine, uh, important for urban low income areas that don't have the uh, time to do this. Um, so it's really important that these extra organisations can do their bit to teach on climate change. Um, so ensuring the education of climate change is also crucial because it could create a generation that lives sustainably. This has successfully been done in Wales. So for those of you that don't know, Wales has the third best recycling rate in the world. Um, it, this went from 4.8% in 1998 to 1999 to 65% in 2022 to 2023. Like how good is that to show that in such a short space of time, such an incredible change can happen. And um, yeah, so 18 of the 22 local authorities actually exceed their 64% target and their targets are going up to 67% for this year. So they're, they're continually improving. Um, one of the ways this was successfully implemented was a huge focus on um, a campaign um, to get all of the community and adults to know about recycling and also a huge emphasis in schools. And now the 21st century Wales Welsh culture is recycling and it's a huge part of their country. So it's just a really good way to show how uh, if we do educate children in the right way, we can have long term successful changes in culture and attitudes. So, um, as I said earlier, I incorporated climate science with community climate action planning uh, last weekend with um, at a Girl Guide Thinking Day event. So they had a whole day and the theme of their thinking day for this year was the environment. So I went and ran uh, 45 minute workshops with the ages of five to 18 year olds. Obviously this posed a huge challenge to me in the planning process as I was like, oh, how am I gonna you know, change this between the age groups? So uh, with the rainbows, which are five to seven year olds, we looked at, um, briefly looked at uh, greenhouse gases, the idea of climate change, and with an emphasis on behavioral changes and what they can do. And then they made posters, um, which they absolutely loved coloring. So that was fab. Then with the um, older girls, so with the eight to 18 year olds, I ran a cl quick climate science uh, lesson. And then we did community climate action planning workshops based on the framework we actually use with adults in the community. And it was a real good success and something I want to continue doing within the community. Um, it also goes to show how these sort of sessions don't just have to happen in the classroom. They can happen in, you know, community youth groups like the guides or scouts, and also perhaps in adult groups like the Royal British Legion or the Ladies Circle or whatever you have going on in your area. So I, we're all here to learn and it's fun to learn a bit of climate science. So I am actually going to give you a brief climate science lesson, but don't worry, it won't be boring because I'll make it fun. Um, so firstly, what we did is I asked them, you know, what do you know about climate change? What are the different greenhouse gases? And we came up with the greenhouse gases. So we obviously have carbon dioxide, which comes from the combustion of fossil fuels, uh, plowing fields, draining wetlands, 
We looked at methane, which comes from landfill and anaerobic digestion in cows, which I obviously said was cows farts, which they found hilarious. Um, nitrogen oxide, which comes from nitrate fertilizers and CFCs that come from plastics, fire extinguishers and aerosols. So this was really, really important to show them uh, where greenhouse gases come from and this open them up to new ideas of um, where they do actually source from, which they hadn't heard of before. So then I covered the greenhouse gas effect very briefly, and I described it as if it was sort of a blanket over the earth. Now, the main part of this was to eliminate the misconceptions and sort of prevent the eco-anxiety, as I made sure the girls knew that we do actually require greenhouse gases for life on earth. We need them in the natural process to keep it warm enough for us to live. And then they understood that it's the excess caused by anthropogenic activities that have caused the accelerated climate change. And I also let them aware of the fact that everything has an environmental impact. We can't avoid it, but it's just the changes we can uh, make to lessen the impact. So that was really fun. So then I also touched on the importance of habitats. So salt marshes, coral reefs, forests, ice and the sea are all carbon stores that intake carbon from the atmosphere and then basically reverse climate change. So it was really, really um, fun for them to understand this because they didn't know this before. And um, it's a really, really good way that we can actually um, have an adaptation in restoring habitats. So with this in mind, when we then went on to create our community climate action plans, they had it on the forefront of their mind of how can we incorporate um, an increase in biodiversity to reduce atmospheric carbon dioxide. So it's a really good way for us to get our communities to net zero. So with the older girls, um, specifically the rangers, I had a few keen geography students in the crowd and I, you know, and they were really happy to hear this. Um, I covered the concept of irreversible climate change and positive speedback mechanisms. So you would think that a topic like this instills fear and eco-anxiety in young children, when in actual fact, it is so important that they understand this because as much as ignorance is bliss, you know, we it is they deserve to know. So um, for those that you don't know, in um, the global carbon cycle, we have something called positive feedback mechanisms. So, um, for example, you have a tree that holds um, CO2 in its biomass because of photosynthesis. And then in a wildfire, this CO2 goes back into the atmosphere which then causes more warming and more climate change and more forest fires, which goes round in a loop of doom, basically. Uh, with ice sheets, for example, um, we have um, ice sheets melting, which reduces the um, albedo surface of the earth. So that's where the sun reflects off of the ice sheets back into the atmosphere, which then causes more warming and a big loop of doom. And I also wanted to quickly tell you about my most favorite nugget of climate science, which is um, ocean currents, positive feedback mechanisms. So do we all know about the Gulf Stream, which is like, if you know, Finding Nemo, where the turtles like zoom in in the Gulf Stream, that one. Yes. So how that actually runs, how the ocean currents are driven is that um, fresh water from ice sheets melts and goes into the seawater, then the difference in density, because the salt water is salty and the fresh water is not, actually causes it to sink, which causes um, like the drive of the ocean cycle. But then with uh, accelerated climate change, we have too much fresh water going into the ocean, which then has actually um, stopped this difference in density. And the ocean currents are actually at their slowest rate this year and are set to stop coming very soon. So this is really, really significant because ocean currents actually drive atmospheric weather systems. So if the ocean currents stop, weather systems will be in one place for 10 to 12 months at a time. So, you know, we're talking drought stuck in one place for 10 to 12 months at a time. 
doesn't sound fun, does it? So if um, multiple uh, positive feedback loops kickstart, we could be in a state of irreversible climate change. So that is something I touched on with the older girls, which they found so interesting and it really kickstarted some passion in them. And many of them told me, even the younger girls, that they now wish to uh, become environmental scientists, which is really fun. Anyways, so um, yeah, when delivering the workshops to prevent the eco-anxiety, I ensured that the girls were reminded and knew throughout that we should separate when we're doing the action plans what we can do as children versus what our parents need to do okay um, and we also looked at like behavioral changes recycling turning off lights walking to school because this is something they can do from today that um, prevents the idea that they wouldn't ever be able to solve anything so um, then we moved on after that climate science lesson to the workshops so to begin with we looked at shared values uh, this is just one photo from one of the many bits of paper. So it was sort of a group discussion that was really energetic and fiery and they were popping out ideas and I had a writer for each sort of section. So um, some ones we have here is a reason why we'd, we would want to solve climate change is because everyone would live for longer, we can protect the rainforest and love animals. How nice. Um, so the idea of this on an adult scale in a community is that we can come up with shared beliefs and values so that it doesn't matter what political background or religion you're from, we all can collaborate and come together to make the action plans. So then we looked at identifying stakeholders and the girls came up with some really good ideas. Here's just one. So we've got councils, governments, leaders, adults, prime minister, farmers, shopkeepers, everyone. And I think you can see from like these uh, lovely little photos and little texts they've done that they were really it was a fun engaging session so the idea of this was that we would know when we create our action plans who are the people that we're going to contact to help us make this happen so it also alleviates the sort of uh, anxiety on them because it's like okay these are the people that can make the change the stakeholders and we can use those to help us as the youth um, so that was really fun and I presented them data from Halston, which is our town on where all the CO2 came from or the CO2 equivalent so that they knew what areas to look at. So then we did our action plans. So just like community climate action, we had themes of uh, farming, energy, travel, housing, biodiversity and education. And this is an example from a few different age groups of what they came up with. Um, I also had little help sheet cards that everyone had access to around the table um, with lots of different uh, ideas or things they could use. So, for example, in energy, we have here on the first photo, um, uh, something that was on the table was the idea of biomass, which is where we burn crops to use the energy. And the girls sort of ummed and ahed and decided, actually, biomass isn't what we want to use because we could use that land for crops. Um, so that's just one example. Or we looked at incineration as an option. So maybe we could change the way we uh, manage our rubbish so that we could use the incineration for energy as opposed to landfill. So they came up with lots and lots of fabulous ideas. Some of them are a little bit crazy, but the crazy ideas are the best. Um, I think we had someone say adopting donkeys for biodiversity. Um, but yeah, you can just have a little um, look through. They even came up with um, encouraging farmers to use hedgerows as biological corridors um, to increase biodiversity, for them not to leave to leave their wetlands as they are to increase biodiversity and reduce you know, intake carbon, um, to buy food locally, eat red meat once a week, community-owned farms. So there's lots of different levels of their ideas of what they could do from top scale stuff to just what they could do, like walking to school, electric buses, all this and that. So um, I made sure that the girls knew that these workshops is actually what has been happening in the community and they were designed for adults to carry out. Um, so they felt incredibly empowered and inspired as the youth because they created these solutions that is meant for adults to do just themselves as a group of young people. Um, 
teaching the climate science followed by the action planning was really, really successful in presenting to them the power they had to act. Um, so even though the climate science was a bit scary and was a bit doomy and gloomy, it was then paired with the action planning, which was a perfect blend. Um, also, because uh, just to finish off their workshop, um, I told the girls that my number one way to tackle climate change would be equal rights to women. Because if we have more women in education, then we have more solutions. We also have maybe less women having babies and less demand on resources. And honestly, the absolute energy and uproar from these young women was crazy. They loved it. Um, they thought it was so fun and they all were aspiring to become environmental scientists and get into the field. So when you have someone passionately explaining about climate change to young people, it really does um, inspire them to go into these working in STEM careers. And I have no hate against men whatsoever, but when it came to um, like women in power during the COVID pandemic, the women absolutely bossed it and other ones who were males, not so much maybe um <laughs> so they they thought this was absolutely fabulous and it they all left away inspired um and super energetic and interested in climate change so uh that is the end of the presentation i'm open to questions if anyone needs to get in contact with me here's my email and a link to my linkedin and i will be emailing the powerpoint to graham for him to send round if anyone needs that so yes, any questions? Maddie, thank you very much. That's wonderful. If you wouldn't mind unsharing your screen, then that would let oh, us yeah. see what everyone is going to be asking questions. Bear uh, with me because I'm not too... Uh... Oh, here we go. Stop share. There yeah, we go. Well and um, the first point I would make is that there's obviously a whole generation of boys growing up who are going to absolutely loathe you. But never mind, eh? <laughs> No, um, I'm I'm so up for teaching the boys too. It was just it was just the guide event, and the women yeah, in yeah, STEM yeah, thing yeah. really worked well for that. But I, I I do have a question from that actually, which is: Do you find that there is a a very different reaction from teaching all boys rather than all girls? And, and what happens if you get a mixed group? Um, no, I wouldn't say so at all. I think um, in terms of mixed groups, the girls are very uh outspoken and I think it's not really a theme that's seen too much anymore in terms of you know disproportionates in classrooms I'm not actually a teacher by the way I've just always um, taught people about climate change whether it's uh, a conversation in the street or nagging my friends for years and years so yeah I'm not actually a teacher but it's just something that I tend to do Okay, well, congratulations. And let me move on to the, the questioners of whom they are rapidly uh, multiplying. But let's start with Caroline in Tring, please. Hi, Maddie and everybody. It's really good to be here. Um, I want to reiterate what you said about women in STEM and also women in power, because I've actually read that in... Um, in areas where women are, are more uh, powerful or in more powerful positions, the, the impact on the climate is much more positive. So women in leadership does actually have an impact for whatever reasons. And again, that's not to negate, um, you know, the contribution of men. I don't know why we always have to say that, but... <laughs> Um, <laughs> I know <laughs> but you know we're soothing the male ego um, <laughs> so yeah I I totally agree with you on on that front um, and despite years of feminism we still you know I'm obviously a lot older than you and I've been through the whole feminist journey and I don't feel like we're a lot further on than when I was growing up so let's um, yeah continue with that I agree um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was this feedback loop, because I felt a little bit scared at that point when you, <laughs> particularly about the oceans and when you were yeah. saying about the, the ocean currents and like, how long have we got? 
<laughs> well, um, so it is, I do keep up with this sort of science and it is slowing down at a really alarming rate. Um, and within the next few years, it could possibly completely shut down. But that's not to say it cannot be restored. Um, there's lots of things that can be done, um, like encouraging ecosystem restoration in the ocean is so important, especially I'm going to like scare you even more. And I'm sorry, um, you'll probably have to deal with eco anxiety. But um, basically, like also the ocean is the biggest carbon store there is. And essentially um, what happens is when it's completely full of carbon, it will actually start a process of reversal where the co2 in the ocean actually goes back into the atmosphere and the ocean has been saving our bacon climate change wise for a very very long time so when we don't have enough fish and biodiversity in the sea it means that it can't really support life and can't intake carbon so um, a good way to overcome it would be to really really have a big focus on ocean restoration um, and I do know some lovely people that are doing smashing work in the field um, so it's just a matter of time really we can't um, replicate ocean currents necessarily how can we uh, translate that into action in communities especially I'm feeling like well I don't live you know we're right in the middle of the country and yeah how does that translate into community action because that sounds well, I, vast to me yeah it is very very vast so there's in terms of like community action um, obviously it having a focus on getting us to net zero does essentially reverse that problem because we all share an atmosphere you know if we're making the changes to get to net zero we're going to lessen our climate change impact and then prevent the ice sheets from melting so that is how it could uh go into community action um it also gets in there by creating this sense of urgency that we need to do something and also it would be really really um important to recognize that actually the environment does bounce back really really fast like if we make the changes of the ocean restoration it will bounce back and we won't have these problems um it can restore itself really really fast and in i definitely was a big part of my degree one thing that the lecturers would always uh, say is that restoring habitats is like the best thing we could do because they intake carbon so fast and bounce us back so quick and reverse these changes. Mm. So in the community, they could look at how they could restore their habitats or increase biodiversity, whether that's just planting seeds on the sides of a grass footpath or having a community orchard for food. Um, and also they could look at how they could support other communities um, so there's this thing called like twinned communities where potentially when they were established, they could twin up with perhaps an ocean community in another area and then uh, work together and share information, share ideas. And they could see um, the ocean restoration that's going on. Mm. You could even like, you know, support um, ocean restoration sort of charities and bits like that. Yeah. I like my that eco. Is there like an eco twinning thing? That would be good. Um, like <laughs> so that. off the top of my head, I can't remember, but there is there is a thing where you can twin um, when doing these sort of projects with across the world or oh. even um, we're hoping it's really down in the midst at the moment, but we're hoping to do one with Scotland as well at some point. Yeah. yeah. So you can just like share information and help one another. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. OK, thank you. That's OK. Nice to speak to you. Yes, you too. Thanks. For Thanks. Thanks, Caroline. Let's move on to David, please. Yes. Uh, when they all said they wanted to become environmental scientists, didn't any of them say they wanted to become politicians or campaigners or set up school strikes or anything like that? No, not this time. So the uh, one of the girls actually did speak to me about Greta Thunberg and how really, really young girls, so like five or six years old, they'd learn in school about climate change and they'd learn about Greta Thunberg and how she did the strike for schools on Fridays. Mm -hmm. um, but they weren't particularly interested in campaigning or uh, environmental radicalism or activism in that way. I mean, even uh, yesterday from like me going to my first parliamentary reception, I've definitely understood that that is the way forward as opposed to 
you know activism in the streets type thing but no none of them said that it was more like careers and they were talking to me about what they were going to choose for their a levels and possibly universities and bits like that so very important stuff kirsty your turn next please i'm sorry kirsten i beg your pardon i know it's quite all right don't worry um I was just curious um, regarding the process that you're going through uh, with community groups, but also with the girls by the sounds of it, in terms of looking at their carbon footprint as a community as part of the process for the action plan. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there are any particular resources that you point groups to, to facilitate them working out what their carbon footprint is in the first place so that they can then move through those stages, particularly yeah, any so. that are good for, for youth audiences um, would be Will be something uh, okay be so um in terms of uh so there's a website i will find out what it's called in just a moment um that way you can access your greenhouse gas emissions per person for an area town or parish let me just quickly find what that's called um that's probably like the best one and then um so hang on a second i'll have to post it um in the chat in a little yeah, while Jackie's so there's, one in the chat the impact tool yeah yes yeah so and we also um are actually setting up a website it's just going through its fin uh, final touches called the great collaboration and on that website is um a tool that can be used by anyone like councils parents um maybe not necessarily children but there will be on there a section of um like activities that well i think there already is a section for activities that children can do like behavioral changes sort of things and it's also going to be a tool for councils and communities to go on the website and understand um you know get access to that website that shows the um, carbon emissions um show the support groups there is so other groups that are doing it and um also other bits of tools like um, mapping techniques of the different parishes um, and just general resources to create the action plans but that is not um, specifically based on education but there is a very very big community of climate educators that are working towards um, educating children on climate change so there's sort of a million things going on and it's all about collaborating to some extent Thank you. That's great. You, as you as you say, there are an awful lot of things going on, and I yeah. too am involved in guides, so so that that's oh, helpful. I will yeah. I will point them in those that direction. Thanks very much. That's okay. Thanks, Kirsten. Amanda, you're up next. Thank you. Um, I mentioned about Jennifer not being able to be here because uh, she's next door in the session on the same thing uh, live here in this conference that I'm at. So um, she she was just mentioning and would have liked to have shared that we're even hearing now of climate anxiety amongst young people getting to a point where it's affecting their mental health to the degree that they've admitted to hospital with a section so it's getting significantly serious um in the impact that it's having so maddie your your um ways of approaching it so that it's seen in a balanced way that yes it's something that's got to be super seriously taken by all humans on the earth but at the same time not something that one needs to get so anxious that it stops us from being able to do anything about it mm -hmm. and um you know i'm really interested in in for on behalf of jennifer as well as myself in in that and what you have to say on that but the other bit if i may just say it because it's more of a statement is when working with young people it's so powerful if they were willing to write a, a letter a question into a parish or town council and simply say, under your new duty of biodiversity, please can parish council tell us what you're doing about climate change? That Full is stop. such a good idea. And yes. that way then, there's so much um, kind of, you know, wake up, that he gets a prod and a prod from a young person is worth a hundred prods from older people. It, it just mm -hmm. is so powerful and impactful at council. I say that as a councillor. Yeah, that's so good idea i definitely will have to uh, use that in the future um so in terms of like eco anxiety i have been uh, briefly part of organizations or i've heard of organizations that really have a focus on the mindfulness aspect of it and they uh, sort of 
use like meditation and bits like that but a good thing to do with like really really young children is less of a focus on actual climate change and more like connecting them with nature because when they you know understand the importance of nature and they connect to it then they have double incentive to um you know protect it but i personally so i've never been the kind of person that um i i do like a bit of mindfulness don't get me wrong but i'm like a really action sort of person and i really enjoy like what i can do to act and like sort of fast paced um sort of thing so the sort of mindfulness aspect where people like get them to meditate and all this stuff I think it is good but I personally think a really really powerful thing is like showing them how they can act and make the change you know and that letter is a really really good idea so that's sort of my focus is more on like the action part of it yeah Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for all the questions and uh, for the presentation, Maddie. There is some wonderful suggestions in the chat, um, yes. links to places that you can go to. And particularly as we dis have the questions and answers, then more people add things very pertinently to the chat. So um, that becomes a major part of the record that um, we keep for these trips. And then as you mentioned, Maddie, we're um, sorting out the great collaboration website so that it will indeed contain all these sorts of things and people can find them quickly and easily. Uh, so we're, we're getting there. Um, I'm not seeing any more hands raised, so I'm hoping that people will jump up if they've got further questions and let us know. Uh, it looks as if Neil, well, you could... <laughs> Amanda, hang on a second. And let me I just... missed it. Where is Maddie coming? Where is Maddie based? Um, I'm based in Norfolk, Suffolk, oh. Norfolk. A little bit far to invite you over to our parish council, but um, <laughs> thank you very much. That's okay. It was lovely to hear from you. Oh, you yeah. did well, Maddie. Um, <laughs> yeah, was, Christian, yeah. Where, where are you based? You said with your uh, guide group, Kirsten, sorry. Hi, I'm just outside Cambridge, Linton. So I'm, oh. I'm not far from you. Yeah, yeah. What is your email? Because I might be able to like come and <laughs> do a little guide thing. Oh, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Um, shall I pop it in the chat or something? Is that yeah, definitely, idea? definitely. Okay. That would be fab. Marvelous. Thank you. I'll pop back with my question because I've jumped the queue. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to uh, Tristram, please. Yeah. Um, thank you, Maddie, for a, a very good talk. Um, I just wanted to mention a slightly difficult thing I think about climate change and that is that I think there are quite a lot of paradoxes things that we think we should be doing maybe aren't so sensible um, so for instance the you know we know that country emerging uh, developing countries like India and China have by far the biggest footprint and and Africa a lot of countries in Africa aren't able to really tackle climate change in the way we can in the UK so you know there's a school of thought that we should be putting more effort into supporting developing countries rather than trying to do our recycling you know, and, and do everything at home. And the other paradox is that, that I, I think is interesting, is that we should encourage tourism to places like Africa because that, that encourages their economies to grow. And if your economy is broken, then you, you cannot tackle net zero projects. You know? so, so there are, are a few paradoxes. But the other, the other thing I wanted to say is that I think there's good news. We, you may, we may be able to make people feel a bit better about climate change by concentrating on the, the massive progress that's been made on uh, zero carbon energy, for instance. And that science has come along, as uh, of course you know, very quickly. And that, so the cost of renewable energy has dropped massively. And we're, you know, we, we got to a, we got, we've made great um, advances in the UK and all over the world. That's happening, and particularly in China. You know, China's is, although it's still growing and its its carbon footprint is still growing, the trend is in the right direction, and and it, it will reverse. So I just, I just wonder whether. Obviously, that's hard to teach young girls about or young people about those more complicated things. But I think there is hope in uh, that we are making a lot more progress than maybe appears from the fact that the the carbon energy is still, or sorry, our carbon footprint is still going up year by year for the next few years. But I, you know, the turning point is in sight, and I think that I think that seems to me that's encouraging and should be taught. Yeah. To so I. 
Yeah, so I will probably uh, maybe eliminate some misconceptions again. So uh, essentially, what you're talking about is really, really interesting. And if I had more time for the guides, I would most definitely tell them about it. So the reason why I'm actually passionate about climate change is because of the real big inequalities associated with it, which sort of touches on what you were saying. So basically, in historic time, our country... Um, and other wealthy Western countries have been the ones that have emitted the most emissions. Um, we industrialize first, right? And we have the money to adapt and mitigate the effects. Like, for example, we have like 10 billion pound barge on the River Thames, whereas in Bangladesh, where they didn't necessarily contribute to the problem, um, they don't have the money to mitigate the effects and they're being flooded multiple times a year, disease, everything. Um, and so who the problem is, who are we to say as our country that China um, cannot industrialize and utilize their oil and gas when we've already done it, you know, because they're like now upcoming and developing. So that is a real challenge. But another thing as well, even though we can say like, oh, you know, our carbon f footprint is... Um, this and theirs is that and they're using loads of energy is we all buy loads of stuff from china and the whole world is like completely connected now so it's not really you know like the industry there in china like we couldn't do without it in a way because that is what fuels us um and what you will find as well is that many of these countries, specifically India, is actually really getting ahead of us because they are now developing after us and they're developing in a renewable sense. Um, and like China as well, they're putting a lot of money into renewables and they're sort of getting ahead of us in a way. Um, as another thing that we could do, which you sort of mentioned on, is we could perhaps like clear the debt in those countries um, and get them to use that for renewables you know, and um, sustainable development. But it just all makes it a nice, fairer world, doesn't it? And that's not necessarily what people in charge like. So that's um, sort of one thing. And I think it is important to teach that to young people because in a way it could relieve the eco-anxiety because they think like, you know, our country's doing enough, but I personally do not agree that our country is doing enough. And, um, you know, it could help them in terms of they can know not to buy that like cheap clothing from China and to buy more, you know, re, uh, sustainable clothing, for example. So I think that might have covered your question. Not too sure. <laughs> yeah, but that's just all I would say. All right. Going back to Kirsten now, who is going to ask her question in turn. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, Actually, I'm responding to something in the chat Um, and young men um, have, and boys have been mentioned in the chat and how that is a different and more difficult audience to reach. And I wondered if you'd done any work with either scouts or going into schools or if you just had were aware of, of anyone addressing that particular angle, because certainly with teenagers come through, through my house in terms of friendship groups with my daughter, um, I would agree it's, it's not something that is an easy conversation <laughs> to bring up. Um, so I just wondered if you had any experience um, with with that area. Um, no. So at the moment, I haven't actually been to the scout group, but I am planning to do so very soon. Um, so it's really good to know that there's potentially these barriers with um, young men. Um, but I would say in terms of like mixed groups, it hasn't seemed to be a problem. Um, and I just like have hope that I could deliver it in a way that would engage them. Um but obviously it is a bit of a problem in schools at the moment with teachers that um, there is a lot compared to when we were at school. There's, you know, a lot less attention and um, people aren't really concentrating like they used to before COVID. So it could potentially be linked to that. Um, so, yeah, I unfortunately haven't seen. OK, Thanks. thank you. At the moment, we have no more outstanding questions. Let me just say then. Oh, we do. I have... don't know how to ask the question. I'm sorry. Okay, Neil, <laughs> what do I do on, on my button? Right. Come on through. OK. Uh, the one of the points I wanted to make is that the one day show that we're organising in Bromyard, um, which follows on to the school survey that's taking place, a feature of that show that we are looking at is something called Carbon Road. It's aimed at the children uh, and on our carbon road, instead of having houses with numbers, we've got 
stations um, with years. So Carbon Road starts in 1924, middle of the road is 2024, and then we go into the future. Uh, my question really to Maddie is you were making points that um, take that zero, uh, that, sorry, climate change, it can be uh, put back or, or, or averted fairly quickly through work in the oceans uh, and various other initiatives. I'm very keen to find uh, illustrations that I can put on my carbon road in the future, which the children can then see that there are steps that can be taken that will have an effect. And further, we're perhaps giving them a little voting system. You'd be familiar with the plastic discs you get in supermarkets to support various charities. Well, if they're given these discs, they can then put those alongside the various initiatives that are put down for the future century, uh, just by way of an interest and for them to show what they think are the most, uh, are the initiatives they'd best like to support. Wow, that sounds like a fabulous exercise. Um, my advice would be like to sort of, I don't know how far you're going into the future, but to sort of keep it uh, realistic in terms of timescales as in like the initiatives or development. So like if you're going to insulate houses, for example, you need to do the feasibility studies and X, Y, Z, and it would probably take a, a little bit longer than just slap bang straight away. Um, for like an ecosystem restoration uh, sense, you'd probably need to look into like scientific literature if you wanted to be really, really precise. But these sort of things are quite unpredictable in a sense, like they can happen a lot faster or a lot slower. And it really depends on like management and bits. But I would say like have a real big focus on like positive adaptation and solutions and like make sure that biodiversity is in the forefront. So you could... um. Ocean restoration, for example, might is like a good key point to put, but it would be quite difficult to like actually like estimate into your um, sort of design. But maybe things like salt marshes, like if you're local to a salt marsh or somewhere like that and like beach restoration, that sort of thing, um, like meadows, they they are really, really good still and they can be more local. And that within, you know, a matter of years, a salt marsh can bounce back. Well, Bromyard is probably further from the sea than any other point in the UK. But uh, any any suggestions you've got, and particularly if you've got graphics that, or places you can direct me to to find graphics so that I can put something up, I don't really expect to get into a great deal of detail because the number of the children will be relatively young because it's primary schools as well as secondary schools that are taking the survey. Um, but something that excites them, an idea that uh, uh, has some uh, relative, uh, some valid validity to it. That's the sort of thing I'm, I'm looking just to get them interested in. So they leave the show believing that climate change isn't a disaster and that there is a future uh, for them to be part of and it, and it could be fun. Yeah. So off the top of my head, I'm not actually sure of specific place you could go, but I can have a little hunt around for you and email to you if that's of any help, if you can yeah, give sure. me an email. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds really fun. Okay. Neil, a question for you. Do you have anything um, as a link to your carbon road that we can see? Because it does sound yeah. quite fascinating. The website will be live from next Monday. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't actually have anything about the carbon road on it because, as yet, I haven't got sufficient confidence that I've got the information flowing through and the people to uh, man the stands on the day uh, to actually talk to people to the children. It's it's an early idea, but I'd be delighted if you would look at the website on Monday, Bromyard Mad Show. Um, it's something in its first year. Um, it's basically all the finance any any finance for it is, is coming from me so everything is being done very much on a on a small budget but we've got huge support from the local schools all of which are sending are asking their parents to uh take the survey which in, will be on survey monkey in about four or five weeks time so can i ask you just give me that um Again, it's the Bromyard something. So. Bromyard Mad show. Mad being the letters M-A-D, make a difference. Uh, Our entire uh, philosophy is that people should uh, make an effort to make a difference and not sit back and wait for councils or not councils so much as governments to come up with uh, the initiatives themselves. Whatever the governments do clearly will have the biggest effect 
but there is a role for individuals to take steps to make a difference. So that'll be going live on about the 4th of March? Um, no, I'm just bringing well, notes into diaries and things so I can get back to you. Right, well, uh, the, the, the website will have uh, a, a section, a page de uh, dedicated just to the actions that are already planned, and one of which is we, we attend a market in Bromyard uh, every Sunday morning. The actual day of the show is the 29th of June. That is the key date for people to look at. The survey for, which is a closed survey because it's by invitation and the invitations go out to all families who have children attending state schools in Northeast Herefordshire. That survey will take place during April. And at the end of April, I can then see, uh, because the last question in the survey is, will you come to the show? I can then see whether enough people are saying they are gonna to come to the show for the show to actually take place. We're fairly confident it will because we've kept the cost down to, to a negligible level. But uh, in short, that is the uh, timetable we're working to. And one other point is that in May, we should be able to open a survey up to anybody to take part in. But it's the fact that the first survey is just for families in rural Herefordshire, uh, and it will be held every year for the next seven years. So hopefully after seven years time, we can see the degree to which the awareness of the issues surrounding climate change have actually provoked people who have made a difference well done well i look forward to um, seeing you go live and we'll, we'll comment back to you um thank you very much to everybody um, for participating and particularly thank you for maddie for a very inspiring um and reactive sort of talk well done um we will be sending out a copy of the video and the presentation and the chat and the uh, discussions to everybody so you can Go back over it in real time if you wish. Um, I would also ask that you, by all means, uh, please spread the word about these banter sessions to colleagues and friends and get them coming. Next week, we have um, one of the, the uh, board directors of the Great Collaborations parent company will be talking about carbon literacy. So I do um, encourage people to come and see that. And then I'm wide open to suggestions from other people for further discussions. I get no shortage of ideas. What I'm lacking is the list of people who'd like to make the presentation. So the ideas are pouring in, but actually finding the person that's going to do the speech is uh, a little bit more tricky. Um, so I'm very delighted, please, if, if you know of anybody who likes to give a speech along the sort of lines that Mandy's done, bright and cheerful and reassuring and deadly frightening at the same time, um, let's do it. Um, I, I do love the way that the conversations trigger things in the chat. David, you seem to be sort of key <laughs> to uh, contribute there. Thank you all very much. Anyone else got anything they want to say? Or we are going to say good day and thank you all very much. Okay, thank you all very yeah, much. Thank you for uh, having me. Care. You're yeah. very welcome, Maddie. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.